Okay, welcome back to part two for the 10 tenets of cooking. So number six is extremely simple. And again, it's often overlooked. Understand the theory of burning the roast. And what, I, what that is, it's, it's, a, it's a saying my friend coined. And it means that if you cook for someone, uh, if you were gonna make them a roast dinner and you completely burnt the thing to a crisp, the action of cooking for someone is still endearing. No one will ever be invited over to a dinner party or, or be invited over to a dinner, or even, like I said, a family member, husband, wife. If you go to cook for them and you royally screw it up, I guarantee you that person will not think less of you. So a lot of people don't cook because of fear of failure. And understand, even in a situation where you invited over eight people and you completely singed the roast, you would probably end up ordering pizzas and laugh about it for 30 years. But none of those people would leave and think, well, you didn't give it a good shot. So the endearment in cooking for somebody else holds most of the power. Just understand that. Number seven, a dorky tip, but it's kind of a good uh, analogy to remember. Uh, when you start cooking, put a pot of boiling water on. The reason you do this is because nothing will slow down your cooking quicker than waiting for a pot of boiling water. And so maybe you're cooking grains, maybe you're boiling a vegetable, maybe you're boiling pasta. As soon as you start cooking, just throw a pot on, turn on the heat and put it in the background. If you use it, use it. If you don't, you don't. But this is a kind of a bigger idea of like when you choose tasks and where to start with what you're cooking, obviously always just choose the thing that's gonna take the longest amount of time, right? If you want to uh, roast vegetables and cook them with a grain that's gonna take 10 minutes when you read the instructions on the back, right? If that vegetable is gonna take 30 minutes, put the vegetable in first and then move on to the grains, right? So try and keep it in an order of time that makes sense. And, and I know that sounds very basic, but a lot of people don't do that and you'll be sitting around for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, waiting for your vegetable to finish when your grains are already done. So cooking is timing, so just try to lay that out. It actually helps to just break out a simple piece of paper and be like, here are the steps in order of what's gonna take the longest to what's not, right? Number eight, we're gonna move on to shopping. 90% of great cooking, and I know this sounds insane, but I truly believe it, 90% of great shopping or great cooking is shopping. And what I mean by that is if you don't start with like decent basic products, your food just won't, there'll be a ceiling to it, okay? That's not to say like, I love getting rid of products, I love uh, inexpensive products, working with them. I'm just telling you from, from a food perspective, a lot of times if you go over some Hotshot's house and they make an amazing tomato sandwich or salad and you think, wow, this is one of the best tomato salads I've ever had in my life. It's the quality of the tomato that makes that dish great. It's not their cooking ability. Like most cooking, when you talk about salads, appetizers, and some main courses, it's literally just assembly, like especially salads. You're basically just assembling raw ingredients and putting dressing on it, right? So the quality of your ingredients is what matters, right? To be honest, a lot of people who are great at cooking, especially think of these like Instagram influencer people that have these beautiful looking meals online. A lot of them are just really good at shopping at finding beautiful produce at finding beautiful vegetables. Um, obviously a lot of people, when you go, man, he made me the best steak I've ever had. They've sourced a really good piece of, of meat. So keep that in mind that when you're in the market and you're going to buy an avocado and you're making guacamole say, Take an extra time to kind of like make sure you have a perfectly ripe one. You know, ask the produce manager person like, hey, can you help me pick out a good avocado? Or if you're doing like a little simple prosciutto with melon appetizer, right? That's assembly. People think it's fancy. You're literally just wrapping prosciutto around melon. Go and ask the person who works at the store. Hey, how do I pick a ripe melon? Because the difference between that dish being great and that dish being mediocre is literally a ripe melon, you know? And as far as the prosciutto, you can totally cheap out on it if you get a ripe melon. You can buy the fanciest uh, prosciutto de parma in the world, but if it's wrapped around unripe melon, it's gonna lose to very average prosciutto wrapped around a very ripe melon. So I hope that kind of drives in the point of why shopping is important, okay?
The ninth tenet is if you have a completely empty pantry and a completely empty fridge and you're completely unstocked, right? Let's say you've never even considered cooking in your life. You're actually almost at an advantage because you can build up from nothing. Um, many people have a onslaught of useless products that are hard to get through. They have redundant products. They have multiples. They have five different red wine vinegars. They have three different Dijon mustards. If you have nothing, I'm telling you, go through some of the assisted documents that we offer in the categories, like the sweet, salt, you know, how to add sour, and just buy a couple of those products, right? Even three for each category. And that will give you enough of a base that if you go to cook anything, you're gonna have something to play off of. So maybe you're gonna invest um, a couple bucks into having a bit of an inventory, but even if you have zero, it's, it's almost an advantage because you can build it up from scratch and you don't have any wasted or redundant inventory. The next tip, and again, back to, I hate to harp on sort of this idea of simplicity, but cooking should be simple, okay? The next tip is when you have people over, ever, if you're cooking for anybody and you are unsure about what you should be making, choose a braised dish, choose a stew, choose a soup. Too many people, um, they die at the hands of trying to sear a scallop last minute when there's four people sitting in their dining room. You know, when the fellas are over for the game, you know, don't be sitting there trying to sear seafood, obviously. You wanna just make chili, right? It's the same thing, like people think about this all the time, like braise short ribs or make a great soup, you know, and just focus on a braised or a slow cooked dish as opposed to something that's last minute. Because the point of having people over for dinner or the point of even cooking for your family is to actually be sitting at the table, relaxed with a glass of wine or a beer or kombucha or whatever you got and chill out, right? And nothing's gonna bring stress into cooking and, and, and the people at the table will feel the stress like trying to do things last minute. So design a recipe or pick a recipe that's gonna be easy during the final like two minutes. So when you think of a chili, you scoop it into bowls, maybe add some cheese or some sour cream, whatever, grate a little bit of chocolate on, like we talked about in the bitter section, serve it, right? That is so much easier than trying to sear off a piece of fish last second. Um, number nine, uh, this one is like a personal opinion. Um, I just genuinely believe that cooking is a lifelong skill, okay? And it needs to be looked at that that way. Too many people look at like, I don't know how to cook. I'll never learn how to cook. For me personally, like, sorry to be blunt, but you're, you're gonna eat like 75,000 meals in your lifetime. Three meals a day for 75, 80 years. It comes out to around that number. It is in a ridiculous concept to never entertain the idea that you're gonna improve your cooking or at least make an effort, even if it's once a month, to cook something and get a little bit better. It would be like, for me, I think it's a little bit like, I'm gonna live in Canada or the US for the rest of my life, okay, from the age of 20, and I'm just never gonna learn English, right? I'm never even gonna to attempt to learn English, even though learning the language would make my life way, way, way easier and more enjoyable. I'm just completely not gonna ignore it. And to me, that's what food is. There are no bad cooks. If you're trying to cook, you're doing fine, okay? There are no bad cooks. There are only people who refuse to learn and people who cook, okay? So that's a personal one. Can be controversial. I know everyone has that one friend that's like, oh, I go to Chipotle for every meal or I only order takeout or, you know, I'm a fitness time guru guy and I, you know, uh, my time's worth money and everyone knows that person, whatever. They don't know what they're talking about. Eating at home saves you so much cash, which goes on to the last tenant, which is cooking at home saves you so much cash, so much cash, okay? Like everyone likes going for dinner. I like going out for dinner. It's fun. You know, you get to try different things. But remember that going out for dinner now, minimum is like 50 beans, okay, minimum. If you live anywhere like New York City, if you live anywhere in California, Vancouver, where I'm from, like you're going out for two people and it's costing $100, right? If you have nothing in your fridge and nothing in your pantry and you're hungry 
And the only way to get food is to buy it out. You're paying a premium for that. Whereas if you can make a quick, simple, comforting stir fry based on what's in your pantry, that might cost you six or seven dollars, right? Versus going out when you don't really feel like it and spending a hundred dollars. That right there, that right there, you're spending $93 for dinner when you didn't even want to go out in the first place, right? And now if you want my business brain to kind of go off on that, you got to earn like 130 bucks, right? Before taxes in salary to pay for your $100 dinner when you would have been happy having a $7 stir fry that you made at home. So the 10th tenet is don't let anyone ever tell you that cooking at home isn't worth your time and your money. And if you really, really, really don't want to spend that much time cooking, just focus on batching together cooking, which means some people like the meathead fitness people, they'll do all seven meals. They'll roast off a bunch of chicken. They'll roast off sweet potatoes. They'll make brown rice on a Sunday and they'll literally put out all seven dinners, right? And they'll do the whole batch for 25 bucks, for 30 bucks, and they'll have a meal every night and it'll cost them like 350 a serving. That's a little overkill, like it's a little barbaric, it's a little Arnold Schwarzenegger-esque, works for some people. But even if you just batch together like three nights a week and you make enough for leftovers, that's six nights a week of good food. And then you can go out on the seventh and you can have no, you can just have no guilt over spending money when you go out because you know every time you go out, you really wanna go out to eat. So let me wrap that up by just saying like too many people actually go out and eat just because there's no food in their house. Just always make sure you have a bit of food in your house so that when you feel like eating, you can make the choice to cook at home. Instead of having to sit at a table and spend 80 or 100 or 150 dollars when you don't even want to do that in the first place, you just want to sit around and watch Netflix and have some leftover chili. So that's it. That's the 10 tenants. Hope you enjoyed them.